Yeah. Yeah, I guess we could go ahead and get started. Um, so to introduce Kert, um, for many of you, um, Kert needs no introduction, uh, but for the rest of you, uh, Kert Lovink is one of the world's leading media theorists. Um, he's a prominent internet critic and observer of all things digital and serves as the founding director of the Institute of Network Cultures at the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. Um, his latest books include Zero Comments, Networks Without a Cause, Social Media Abyss, and Organization After Social Media, um, written with Ned Rossiter. Uh, his most recent publication, Sad by Design on Platform Nihilism, was published last year. Um, and just to say, um, you know, working in technology, things tend to change pretty quickly. Um, a lot of scholarship doesn't really age well. It grows pretty stale over time. Um, Kert, however, is one of the few scholars whose work only seems to increase in relevance over time. Um, like a good wine, I guess it, it gets better. Um, Kert's most recent book, Sad by Design, is a good example of this. Uh, it's been sitting on my coffee table throughout the pandemic and has ripened quite nicely as the virus has slowly chipped away at our analog roots and pushed us, um, pushed our social and economic livelihoods onto the digital platforms that Kert so expertly analyzes. So without further ado, I will pass the microphone to her. Yes, thank you all. Uh, I'm uh, pleased to uh, return to Santa Barbara in uh, this way. I spent some time um, there in, um, in early 2003. And um, I've been coming back uh, a number of times, but um, to be honest, I haven't been uh, for quite some time now. Um, I um, have been to the United States and to California last time in um, um, 2016. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy. I skipped the, uh, the Trump era. Uh, so I was very pleased not to come. And um, now I'm looking forward to, um, to return. Um, yes, uh, and uh, of course we will find uh, the world and uh, the United States, but also Europe, of course, in, uh, in a very different um, stage. We're still in the midst of the COVID pandemic and um, uh, still in the midst of, uh, you know, a turbulent uh, time um, when we're uh, speaking about, um, you know, the, um, uh, the political upheavals, the right-wing populism, uh, Brexit is about to happen uh, here in a few weeks uh, from now. So um, uh, this is a really big um, change for Europe. Um, in a way, a very delayed one, if you like, uh, a completely unnecessary uh, in our uh, perspective. But um, nonetheless, uh, uh, you know, also on the east side, there's uh, now a really big turbulent uh, political uh, upheaval with Poland and Hungary. Um, so uh, the tendencies uh, that uh, were there and that I described uh, indeed in uh, the book, uh, said by uh, by design, um, they are um, certainly um, uh, you know still uh, very vivid. Um, today, I'm going to speak about uh, one specific chapter about the book that I've been uh, working on because uh, this chapter uh, it's uh, number five. It's called Media Network Platform Three Architectures. Uh, by the time when I um, wrote it, I really provocatively and deliberately uh, wrote it as um, a thesis, as a number, as a you know hypothesis, as something that um, I wanted to put out uh, in the world, and that I thought you know, we, we, should, we will focus on for, for many uh, years or if not decades uh, to come. Uh, tonight, uh, so I'm going to focus um, 
uh, on this, uh, you know, what I see as a transition, as something that um, uh, maybe in a Deleuzean sense, you know, is called a, a kind of an assemblage of of terms, and and um, uh, maybe even um, you know three uh, uh, plateaus, if you like. Um, I'm going to uh, speak first about this relationship between the three terms that, if you like, defined my uh, biography, but also my generation, um, media, network, and platform. Um, now, okay, we could say, uh, you know, this is might be uh, dangerous because there is, at least from my point of view, you know, the, the temptation to see them as eras, as uh, things that, you know, come one after the other. Uh, however, uh, it's probably better uh, to approach this from, let's say, a structuralist or even post-structuralist perspective. Um, and uh, see them as uh, plateaus that move and and also uh, you know that um, hit uh, collide uh, and maybe even divide in different directions of course let's start with the the term media because um, my uh, you know my generation is of course uh, defined by it uh, coming from the McLuhan uh, era and of course the German media theory in my uh, perspective I consider myself uh, you know a pupil of um, of Hitler but also Tevelite and many many others um, in that um, West German I have to say media theory uh, school that uh, really um, came into being uh, in the 1980s um, so this is a materialist um, uh, media theory that is, uh, however, not Marxian you know, per se, but um, you know is is deeply materialist, but rooted in the arts and uh, humanities, and uh, is in that sense more uh, Nietzschean, if you if you like. <clears throat> uh, it's not French at all. Uh, I think the the French understanding of media and communication is rather poor uh, and uh, it is uh, no coincidence that there's no really French thinker that we associate with media yeah, for the right reasons. Of course there are Canadians uh, and if there are two big schools I think uh, in the world uh, I would say um, you know we often compare the the Canadian school with the German uh, school. Uh, that would that's certainly makes uh, makes sense however the, the french uh, you know they have contributed a lot but uh, not necessarily at least in that era um, to the media question of course now days uh, you know we can uh, go through the work of ben astigler and uh, he's um, of course an, an exception he is also a latecomer uh, he is not part of the generation of uh, foucault derrida uh, uh, he's a he's a, a, a student of uh, Derrida, of course. Um, he sadly uh, passed away um, in in August. I happened, to, you know, to be in a fortunate situation that I was uh, able to work with him um, in the last uh, week on Thursday and Friday. We had the first, uh, let's say, academic conference gathering. Also, I would say. Uh, of uh, people who closely worked with Bernard, and there are many, many. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, this is very much uh, on my mind. But even Bernard, I would say, uh, you know, is, is not necessarily a media and communication uh, scholar in that sense. He's a, he's a philosopher and um, one that uh, understood very, very well uh, the technology and uh, the digital technology um in uh, in particular okay um of course in the 90s uh, we see the rise of networks uh, networks are of course they are, go back a little bit uh, further uh, already in the 70s uh, i grew up here in amsterdam at uh, amsterdam university 
with so-called social media or social uh, social network analysis uh, that was uh, already quite uh, established uh, in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, in particular to look at um, uh, you know how the elites uh, were um, ruling uh, the world, uh, and um, especially you think of uh, research done uh, into not only um, inter intertwining uh, power relations uh, in the multinationals and large corporations, global corporations, but also in the in mafia. So, uh, so um, both uh, the people who studied. Uh, uh, corporations and the mafia were already very acquainted with um, um, network analysis. Uh, now, then, of course, uh, you know the the internet rises, and that's uh, already happening in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, I encountered it for the first time in 89, and uh, of course, this then defines the whole 90s and uh, and beyond. With the network, uh, you know, which uh, of course uh, comes together in the work of um, a scholar like um, uh, Castells, um, we see um, a, a very strong metaphor uh, at play. A metaphor that is, uh, of course, uh, technical, uh, and it, the network has uh, technicalities, uh, but mm, uh, it is definitely also a form uh, of organization, a form uh, you know, in which uh, new forms of social relationships are uh, taking shape in society, in Western society. Um, now, and this, uh, let's say, defined uh, very much uh, the, the 90s and the early uh, decade of, uh, of the 2000s. Uh, but then, of course, uh, something happened. Um, and that is that uh, a, a, an almost uh, strange Hegelian move happened. And uh, I'm going to talk about that uh, now. So um, the, what I have to say here about these three terms, you can read in the book. But um, in the last two years, of course, I have uh, focused more uh, on the development of um, 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 yeah, what we could maybe call platform theory. Mm? Um, and it, it is really a, a, a question of why the platform, you know, came into being and, and became such an hegemonic and uh, dominant uh, form of organization, right? Both in economic sense, in, in financial sense, if, uh, in organizational sense, but even uh, you know, to speak it in, in uh, 70s terms, in libidinal sense, right? Uh, so the platform is also, is not just uh, something, you know, uh, that I myself, uh, let's say, I associate it more with a jail, right? With a cage. Huh? For me, it, it, it has a, a lot of very, very uh, negative connotations. However, uh, this uh, is my personal view and it may even be you know a political point of view um, maybe I feel the loss myself of uh, of the dominance of the network um, but um, especially for the younger generations uh, this is not necessarily the case right and so I had to uh, in part also accommodate myself to that and a large part of the, the research uh, here at the, my Institute of Network Cultures uh, has also been about that very question of the attractiveness of uh, being together uh, on the platform, right? Um, and of course, this is related to the, the, the question of why, uh, you know, the further development uh, of the internet has completely come to a halt, and uh, you know we have, we're on the social media uh, now for you know a good ten, almost fifteen years, and nothing has replaced uh, this social media. Had the same logic; uh, it has only become stronger. And in my in my uh, understanding, 
uh, this uh, stagnation has also caused a lot of uh, you know regression not only uh, amongst uh, its uh, users the billions of users uh, but also uh, politically speaking right so so a, 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 a technical a techno social development has uh, been uh, hijacked if you like uh, by a handful of uh, uh, companies um, who have uh, uh, understood uh, how to uh, capture the imagination, how to m make users addictive, how uh, to make it impossible uh, uh, to leave. Uh, and so, uh, well, that is what I've described already in uh, the social media abyss, even in the, the books before networks without a cause. This, uh, this, this development, this latent form of uh, stagnation, has been around with us, in fact, quite some some time. Of course, uh, the global financial crisis uh, uh, goes back to 2007, 2008. Now that's already a good uh, 12 years. Uh, so, um, so this uh, development is by no means uh, recent. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I will start the, um, uh, the the PowerPoint now, and then uh, let's see if um, uh, um, it, is it visible. It works well. Can you share it? So I think so. you're a co-host. You should be able to share your screen. That that should work. Yeah. I, should I do that? Yeah. Um, okay. But uh, let me see where we do that. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. That should be here. And then share screen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There we go. All right. Um, Okay, so um, I'm going to the next part uh, now, and um, I will um, I will read um, from um, yeah mostly material that has not uh, yet been um, uh, been published because I'm still uh, working on uh, on this um, let's say a platform theory. Um, after uh, you know, after the the, the sad by design book, which I finished in uh, late uh, eighteen. Um, okay, there we go. Um, yeah. yeah, can you see it now? Yeah. Okay. Let's dive into social media wariness the cause of our tired eyes. What are the techniques of resignation that we are exposed to? The blissful ignorance after browsing an entire ecosystem of narratives is not surprising. Culture is a pendulum and the pendulum is swaying. The organized optimism, hard-coded in online advertisements and other forms of algorithmic advice, turned out to be merely producing anxiety. As Carolyn Coles Richard stated, what can't be cured must be endured. The suffering, sorrow, and misery is getting tagged and filtered by our own self-censorship. We've been captured and feel frozen. What we receive is the anger and anxiety of the online other the growing imbalance in the distribution of digital enchantment is neither causing a revolution or revolt, nor does it fade out. Welcome 
to the great stagnation. We, the online billions, are stuck on the platform. And this uh, stack, stuck on the platform is also the pre preliminary title of the text um, I'm going to read you here, um, which uh, is a um, yeah, premiere. I haven't really uh, read it um, so far. And it's about regression after the network demise. In this social age, the dream of many students is to start their own platform. This motive already presumes an entrepreneurial aspiration many are not even aware of. How did the platform become such a desired object? This is how artists, activists, designers and geek envision how to reach their audiences. Right? So we don't use the word media anymore. We're not reaching audience through the media. Uh, we're not going to network anymore to reach people. That's, uh, that's too cumbersome. Huh? We go straight to the platform, right? And I've heard people saying this many, many times. And even uh, I get students who approach me and say, I want to start a platform. Can you help me hmm? start a platform? This is a normal question, okay? Uh, we shouldn't laugh about it, um, but it's very telling. It's, it tells something about our age. So why strive to become an influencer when you can also become the owner of the platform, right? I mean, the, the, obviously the, the influencer is a victim itself, right? It's a, it's a person who works under the regime of the platform, right? So we can say that, uh, you know, under the migrant kits or something like that, hmm? uh, you know, people aspire, young people aspire to be influencer. But, um, you know, the real ones, the clever ones, hmm? they don't want um, uh, a piece of the cake. They want to own the whole bloody bakery, as we uh, used to say it. All right, uh, and what, why, why wouldn't you, uh, you know, just found directly and own the bakery hmm? if you can stay, if you can. Welcome to platform pet fetishism where social relationships are defined by the values created in social interaction itself. In this outgoing neoliberal age, the idea is to look down on the poor suckers that can only buy and sell. The trick is to persuade others to play accordingly to the rules that you, the owner, aka the designer of the market set, right? And you can read this in the writings of Peter Thiel. He's uh, probably the best uh, to uh, describe, uh, you know, how he looks down uh, on uh, on the user right and which is which is very funny because uh, uh, yeah Mark Zuckerberg is st still uh, himself a, a victim of the platform ideology he has to everywhere he goes has to tell that we that he is empowering the users right but Peter Thiel who's on the board of uh, Facebook is much more an earnest uh, person and uh, uh, you know gives us a whole other uh, picture uh, of this hmm? Um, and of course, uh, we know that the, the users are, of course, uh, you know, uh, they are um, by no means uh, empowered. The promise of the platform is an easy one. Everyone benefits, benefits, everyone benefits, both producers, customers and founders. No winners or losers, everyone's included and plays along. The robust software platform as Kultur Ideal has long replaced the homepage, the blog and the website and the related web design studio as the startup model. 
right? Who wants to become a web designer, you know, these days? If you can own the platform, come on. No? We long to harness value instead of losing ourselves in the messy, messiness of the rhizomatic network. The platform dream has further consolidated the venture capital model of operation of hyper growth in the shortest amount of time aimed at a unicorn market domination and eventually monopoly position. While only very few will become billionaire, the lottery aspect of the ruthless Darwinist strategy still attracts many. It's hegemonic, as they say. Elon Musk's appeal has not yet fainted across the world, by the way. So Elon Musk is a really a global, uh, you know, example uh, here, maybe even more so than Bezos or uh, Zuckerberg for that matter. The celebrity obsession is such uh, that the pop critique of capitalism will not really question the right young people have to become a billionaire. We all want to run our own platform, regardless what we are longing for. Platforms create marketplaces simple connectors of supply and demand that bear little, if any, costs of production, yet they are, as we know, rarely neutral. They are not mere service providers, as in many cases, the platform are also significant players themselves in those markets. Revenue-wise, these are not technology companies, but advertisement giants. It's why I think, uh, you know, both Facebook and Google have got nothing to do with uh, technology and barely contribute something in the further development of them. Huh? They are very advanced um, advertisement companies. Hmm? And in that sense, they should be uh, looked uh, at. So in a strange way, in a way, they are made media companies. Huh? Uh, although, you know, you could say, okay, advertisement uh, has uh, played a role uh, even outside of um, of uh, you know the traditional definition of media. Platforms do not merely stage, organize, and regulate markets. They also command outside influence over neighboring businesses and the wider ecology. Think of road congestion, air pollution. Uh, of hoovering empty uh, Uber taxis or the delivery of uh, each e-commerce package in comparison to a visit to a mall or shopping street where items can be purchased all at once. The core of the capitalist rationale remains socializing the costs while privatizing profits under the banner of personal choice and convenience. Internet platforms turn hegemonic the moment the medium is no longer becoming and close down to fine tune behavioral modifications of its user base. The internet simply is, and that's what in my circles is called the infrastructural turn, right? The internet is no longer developing, it's becoming, a, it's an infrastructure. And of course, as an infrastructure, you know, it can be improved or maintained, um, uh, but um, yeah, it is no longer becoming in, in that sense. The platform is the message. Content is tired, platform is wired. According to Mike, uh, Mark Steinberg, uh, who wrote this, uh, this book about uh, the origin of the platform. I can highly recommend it. Um, going back to uh, in Japan, especially in the 1990s, when this idea of the platform uh, was uh, invented. Uh, so the platform is not coming from California. 
And I think this book uh, really uh, convincingly shows uh, that uh, most of the uh, characteristics we now um, ascribe to platforms are really, uh, you know, to be found already in, uh, in Japan uh, of the 1990s. So that's um, Mark Steinberg. Uh, um, and according to him, platforms have become a universal translation device. It's the place where money, people and commodities meet and transactions can happen. See them as abstract mega nodes. And I quote him, almost anything can become a platform if one merely calls it uh, such. Uh, and this is, uh, this is uh, also the, let's say the generic appeal that uh, you know, young people uh, almost intuitively associate with, right? So almost anything or any type of activity can become a platform. So that's good to uh, remember. Of course, the problem there is not everybody can own the platform, <laughs> uh, but th that's uh, another issue. We scroll down its never ending, ever changing pages and move away from the previous static emph emphasis of new media as archives and databases towards a regime of temporary lifeness plus transactions. Only one room left. Maybe you remember that uh, phrase you find everywhere when you go to booking.com uh, or, um, right? Um, and you still think of, the, of a website like that as a static database or, uh, you know, or as an archive. But how is that possible? You come to a database and immediately eh, there's a lot happening. And apparently there's hundreds of thousands others on this site and you've just chosen something and it says only one room left. How is that possible, right? And that is the lifeness uh, of, of the platform. Um, its core logic, a cruel, never-ending uh, metamorphosis of small differences. Uh, the offer you can't refuse. And uh, we, we've been uh, all been in that uh, situation. Um, the platforms that we inhabit are aspirational media for the users that go there in search of something. I am here, now what? do I want again? Unlike the rational cold and empty search engines, and the search engines are very cold in that uh, respect, designed by IT managers and library scientists, uh, think of Google, today's psychological platforms offer personalized fuzzy information for the swiping dazed and confused. Unlike searching through the darkness of the archive, being able to compare the, uh, the platform is giving us the feeling of being on top of the world, right? So it's, a, it's a very different. And that's why Google is losing out time and again uh, when it comes to platforms, because they still have this static idea of the IT engineers, of the archive and the database, uh, but none of the platforms uh, are even remotely uh, anything like that. Even on Amazon, hmm, which uh, is still maybe a little bit of a, hmm, a hybrid, uh, it, it is full of lifeliness. Platforms as gated safe spaces know us intimately. They recommend us according to our taste, preference, previous orders, search uh, history and likes. Platforms remember and know how to comfort. And so they're, they're comfort media, very different. And so in, in that sense, they're um, warm. Now, I, I don't want to go into the comparison what uh, McLuhan once said about warm and cold, but uh, yeah, it, it is uh, something to further look into. We messy humans, despise to start each time from scratch. That's why we love the idea 
that the platform knows us. Why should we start time and again, you know, to train those stupid machines, right? Why? No, the machine will know us, right? And uh, many of the users find that a comfortable idea. After all, we're not called scientists interested in objective knowledge. We'd like to save time, take shortcuts, and appreciate that the machine uh, acknowledges our weak spots and remembers them for us and talks to us, tells us how close the Uber driver is, what comparable products costs elsewhere, and what this user uh, that just showed up is uh, sharing with others. We're petty and break down easily as our busy multitasking lives are on the brink of collapse anyway, all the time. This is why we find comfort on the platform. Our new virtual domicile, formerly known as the homepage. David Columbia noted that conservative platforms like Parler, but also Discord and others are, I, I, I quote, a notable improvement over Twitter because they deny the far right, the audience of not yet hypnotized people. That is one uh, of the main reasons for using social media. But that's not enough. They should not exist. So what does that mean when we say that social media should not exist, right? It's a, it's a point where uh, a, a critique of the social media very often uh, come uh, to. Are at, attract, um, so, so, um, so what does that mean? Uh, are at, uh, extractive platforms comparable to nuclear weapons that once invented, built and employed have simply become part of the human story? And so this is really a question and this is very much on my mind. Uh, can we overcome the social media logic? Um, and we have not overcome the, uh, the atom bomb, right? It is with us, we can contain it, uh, uh, but um, uh, it is, uh, it is uh, still there, even um, you know, if it's no longer playing such an important role in, the, in, the, in politics or in the uh, collective uh, uh, imagination or in the hijacking, let's say, of the collective uh, imagination as it once did in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and uh, even also, of course, especially 1980s before, um, you know, being put uh, aside. And so my question really here is also, and the same with the platform, yeah? can we overcome this logic of the platform and can we overcome the, the logic of the social media or should we rather see it that, you know, we kind of pacify it perhaps? Um, put it, not put it aside, but hmm, maybe it will be overruled by other logics, hmm? but still this platform will be with us. And this is my thesis. The platform uh, will be with us for quite some time. And of course there, uh, it's also interesting that, uh, you know, the socialist uh, thinkers of uh, this, let's say the wing, the socialist wing of the accelerationists have such a deep love affair for, for the platform, right? Because they believe that uh, in, when socialism will come to America, uh, the, the platforms will be turned, uh, you know, for good, right? Platforms for good. Huh? Uh, because why? Because the network is messy, uh, it's not going anywhere, it's not cost effective. Uh, uh, why, uh, why, uh, you know, do that? Huh? And so there's even a, a kind of a Marxian school that uh, feels uh, a very strange uh, attraction to uh, the uh, unheard of, uh, you know, centralization and uh, rationalization, uh, automation, of course, uh, uh, that comes uh, with uh, platform, right? 
So, um, so we cannot uh, simply, uh, you know, go back to some kind of uh, an anarchist uh, dream, uh, even though, you know, I myself, I am still a, a fierce uh, supporter of, um, let's say, uh, you know, softwares that uh, are based on uh, decentralized uh, uh, federation of uh, nodes and so on, so on. Um, right when uh, when we come to when it comes to uh, the the centralization, there's really something. And of course, this goes back also maybe, and Jan knows a lot about that, uh, to the critique of globalization and the question, you know, if globalization uh, will be overcome, just uh, you know, uh, as uh, as the Roman Empire was once overcome, namely uh, uh, through a process, a lengthy process. Uh, of, uh, of of simply decline, right? And so, uh, is this the only road the, the globalization can take, right? Um, or are there um, uh, alternative uh, uh, approaches? Uh, and of course, world systems, uh, uh, you know, uh, theory has something to say uh, there. But um, yeah, we we should uh, in this uh, phase in which. Uh, let's say uh, there's an, an unheard of um, um, economic uh, concentration of power in the hands of very few. Um, we should go back to, uh, and maybe, uh, you know, uh, start a, a dialogue uh, between, let's say, the world systems and um, the, the question of uh, the critique of, uh, of, of platforms. I think this is really, really necessary. Um, uh, also because um, in my understanding, um, even you know, though I'm still a big supporter of it everywhere I go, uh, uh, the, um, uh, yeah, the, uh, the social media alternatives that uh, uh, have been based on decentralization uh, and federation uh, over the past decade have miserably failed, right? So my generation, and with me, many, many younger people have miserably failed to come up with uh, an, not even a, you know, a slightly al alternative, attractive um, model uh, for the, um, uh, to replace, let's say, Facebook, Google, but also, uh, um, uh, of course, uh, Amazon, um, now, I don't know, uh, we shouldn't perhaps talk here about uh, Airbnb and Uber because I think that especially these ones are quite easy to overcome and there are very, very strong, viable, local, uh, you know, alternatives on, um, on a city to city level, especially for, for services like that, right? Uh, and we can be very optimistic there that, uh, let's say, a taxi cooperative can, can beat uh, uh, Uber um, and uh, uh, so uh, not all is is lost, but uh, you know at at certain levels, um, especially when we're talking about logistics and uh, infrastructure, um, but also about media and communication, uh, we are only seeing a, a further concentration. Of power, of course, within the frameworks of geopolitics, right? Now, now the geopolitics is not the, the topic here of my lecture, but obviously uh, there are three uh, major blocks now, and uh, all the platforms, media, and networks are dealt with within those geopolitical blocks, being uh, the American one, the European one, and uh, the Chinese one. Okay, uh, but even if you say that, uh, you you don't say much. Yeah? Because uh, even within those uh, geopolitical realities, the question of uh, unheard of uh, uh, monopolization uh, uh, is going strong. I look at China, it's, it's, it's incredible, um, the, the, the kind of uh, concentration of power uh, there of uh, uh, companies like uh, WeChat, uh, Alibaba, and so on and so on, right? So, um, so the, the, these tendencies are uh, going quite deep, uh, deep into, uh, let's say, the current uh, uh, regimes and the current uh, systems. OK, 
Okay. Um, maybe I'll uh, leave it uh, here and uh, because we can go on, uh, you know, further into, especially um, uh, in this uh, text, new text, I'm, I'm going a bit deeper into, um, you know, the, the definitions and uh, propositions that, uh, that uh, uh, Mark Steinberg is, uh, is making uh, in, his, uh, in his platform book. Uh, but um, I'll leave it here and uh, let's go to uh, uh, the discussion. Thank you very much. Fascinating talk. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Herd. Um, super interesting. Uh, so with that, um, the floor is open for question. Um, you can either, yeah, uh, signal in the chat that you have a question and, um, and I'll go ahead and, and call on you. Could we can I ask a question, Brett? This is please. Yeah, hi, Herrick. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, I'm just quite intrigued by the slideshow, and I wonder if you could talk about the relationship between the images, many of which are memes endemic to the very platforms you're talking about, mm. and your critique, because one could imagine that slideshow playing for a very different kind of presentation one that was about decentralization, that was about popular forms of expression, um, that was about using these peer-to-peer -peer over central networks for um, more liberatory purposes, et cetera. So I wonder just sure. if you could talk about the, the, the images. Oh, of and, and, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, my work is of course uh, going in various directions. I'm an activist myself. And I've stressed that, and so since, uh, well, maybe 2010 latest, just before Occupy and the Arab Spring, um, we already came to this conclusion that um, uh, we, uh, we needed to have a networked, um, you know, social media um, architectures uh, that uh, not only cannot be censored, but um, uh, that can also be used more effectively uh, for um, social, cultural, and uh, political uh, forms of organization, which uh, you know I have uh, uh, described uh, uh, with Ned Rossiter as uh, organized networks. Hmm? Uh, and I'm still working uh, on on that because uh, it's uh, it's a very urgent uh, topic for for organize for you know for um, movements around right and in my view it's, it's very tragic in America that uh, um, for instance Black Lives Matter has not set up uh, its own uh, you know strong uh, strong network there are of course some uh, local local nodes but. Um, uh, from an organizational point of view, uh, these are uh, media that, uh, or these are social movements that are still entirely uh, depending uh, also on its uh, own, uh, you know, uh, reach of its audiences and mobilizations on the, on the existing social media platforms and have not uh, moved a, a single bit uh, in, uh, in, um, let's say another uh, direction. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, um, the slides that you're looking at, um, of course, are related uh, to, uh, you know, the ongoing researches that I'm doing, uh, which, is, which are more about the emotional uh, hijacking, the uh, behavioral modifications that are happening uh, when using the dominant social media is what I've, you know, described in the book, in my sad by design essay, but also in earlier work on, uh, on distraction. And there, of course, uh, Stiegler is also playing an important role uh, in the explanation uh, of that. Um, currently, uh, I've been uh, describing this um, uh, in uh, uh, essays that recent essays uh, that one came out in November 
um, on uh, the, what, what I call the autonomy of uh, Zoom fatigue, right? Exactly what we're, we're doing here, uh, performing here right now in this lecture. Um, and uh, so I, I'm carefully studying uh, uh, Zoom fatigue and, um, uh, but also I, I wrote about, um, you know, the role of cancel, cancel culture and call out culture uh, which I, I think is particularly destructive for, uh, you know, for protest movements. And uh, uh, so, uh, and the question of uh, the, in, the, the intimate, uh, let's say, intertwinement between call out culture, cancel culture, and, uh, and the social media platforms. Right? Uh, because for young people, uh, there is no uh, cancelling other than, uh, you know, through, um, uh, social media accounts, right? Mm? It's very often not about personal cancelling because they they don't know uh, these people uh, personally uh, at all. So um, so yeah, I wrote about that uh, in in August. My recent writings, if you are interested, you can find on the website called eurozine.com, uh, based in Vienna. Um, so. Uh, so yeah, that's that's an explanation. Uh, I hope, and uh, I think, uh, especially under the COVID uh, regime, uh, you know, the the collective uh, mood, especially amongst young people, is very very dark. Uh, there's no way to go. Um, uh, loneliness, uh, depression, uh, are really really uh, on the on the rise. So uh, there's uh, there's no reason uh, to believe that uh, this kind of, uh, let's say, uh, programmable uh, affects, hmm? as the, you know, the Deleuzean industry calls it, uh, that this is uh, somehow over, you know, it, it is not. So, okay, that's it. Hmm? <laughs> well, let's, um, I think uh, Esther has a question. Oh, yes, uh, hi. Um, um, thank you so much um, um, for everything. Uh, such a, a beautifully deep dive into sort of the history of um, networking um, and uh, networking should remain weird. We don't want it to become, um, mm -hmm. you know, controlled or so I, I I really appreciate even sort of the weirdness of the you know collection of your um, images I, I think it's really in uh, you know in sync with uh, what you're asking us to think of as you know the potential of uh, the platform so um, so my um, my I'm gonna just take a, a quote. Um, from something that you said, and I just want you to respond to it. Um, well, I, 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 I'll quote it, I'll respond to it, and then I just want to hear you talk about it. So, um, quote, the internet should not exist, mm -hmm. and you may have been quoting somebody else, uh, I'm sorry, is a statement that can be read two ways at least. If ideology were fully successful, the internet would be irrelevant. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I know. Um, and of course, this is um, a part of, uh, you know, what we could call the, um, the infrastructural term. And uh, the most simple um, comparison people make there at that level is the one, um, you know, the comparison between us noticing the existence around us of electricity in comparison to the uh, awareness that we, yeah, have already lost, in my view, of, uh, you know, noticing the, uh, <laughs> let's say, the, um, yeah, the spheric um, invasion around us of internet. And so, um, yeah, I, I think 
the comparison between internet and electricity is made uh, more and uh, more. You, you, you slowly see it uh, uh, coming. In the past, we, we didn't do that. Hmm? We didn't, it, because for us, uh, it was so new and, uh, you know, maybe electricity was um, such a thing that was, was simply there. Now, of course, if you have been, you know, to Nigeria or to other places uh, around the globe, you will know that, um, you know, it's often also the other way around. So there's often a lot of internet, but no electricity. Uh, so uh, let, let's not, um, you know, turn this into some kind of a, a global um, kind of story. But yeah, the two of them are very uh, interlinked, uh, started to be. Um, and that is causing the internet itself as, as a structure with governance, with all, all, all its technical aspect to disappear because um, our generation at least loved to, dis to discuss, uh, you know, the network architectures. But I think these days, uh, especially young people, they have no clue what, what you're talking about and also do not share the passion that we once had uh, for, for, the, for that. Instead, uh, you know, they are dealing with a very, very different, uh, let's say, emotional states. Uh, and uh, yes, in, in my research of the last five or so years, I have increasingly moved myself, uh, you know, to in that direction. Oh, I, thank, you. I thank you so much. Thank you. I have a quick question. Um, so I know over the over the past couple of months, um, there's been a lot going on in the EU um, with regards to digital regulation. Um, you know, the Digital Services Act is mm -hmm. going to be unveiled hopefully this month. Um, there's the Data Governance Act, which was recently proposed, and the um, Digital Markets Act. There's there's all of this regulation that is like it's it's coming it's it's in the pipeline and it's being negotiated and i think that you know you i really like your use of the phrase the great stagnation um i think that i think this idea of, of stagnation is um the way that i see it it's it's central to a lot of the the regulation that has been proposed uh, in europe and it's the idea of um uh, data sharing uh, interoperability um portability these are these are all issues which are challenging sort of the dominance of platforms, at mm -hmm. least in, yes. in the EU. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if you could maybe comment on um, sort of what's going on in Europe and how you interpret it and whether you... Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, um, Europe is very, very much uh, behind and uh, so much um, so that, you know, we could, uh, by reintroducing some, some of the more um, funny, let's say, Marxian or Hegelian uh, dialectics, huh? we could see Europe, you know, being so much behind that it, it, in a dialectical flip, huh? it, it suddenly finds itself uh, in some kind of weird uh, avant-garde situation, but not because uh, it is so advanced, but just because hmm, it makes a move that uh, in a completely different political uh, framework uh, suddenly uh, f finds itself, uh, uh, you know, uh, with very, very diff uh, uh, interesting outcomes. And so that would be my, my uh, approach. Um, First of all, I think, uh, well, a lot of what you just uh, mentioned, all mentioned, uh, will need to be um, uh, really re being reassessed and uh, uh, taken up to its merits after Brexit. So um, the, the question of really, let's say, uh, a German-led or a Franco-German uh, kind of technological, uh, you know, sovereignty, uh, to use that uh, word, 
um, yeah, is is uh, really ultimately, uh, in my view, uh, what it is all about. However, uh, this uh, will by no means have anything to do with digital that, uh, you know, as it, as it is understood in California. And so there's no, it's a world apart from, uh, first of all, because the Germans are, of course, completely obsessed with the digitization uh, of their own uh, uh, automobile industry, right? So whereas you uh, over there are focused on, on social media and whatever, right? Imagine that California had only one big obsession, and that was the digitization of the car industry. Now, obviously, that's not the case, right? Uh, yeah, no, open, in, uh, you hardly hear about it. Huh? Uh, however, here in Europe, huh, of course, that is uh, that is very, very much uh, a reality. What all is also very um, uh, strange there is that many, many of these things are all uh, top down. Their um, um, uh, regulation is top down, uh, and none of it comes from bottom up, right? So uh, they, they can say whatever they like about entrepreneurial spirit or creative industries, whatever, right? In Europe, there's none of that, right? So, um, so it's very, in that sense, quite old school, but that's interesting also because there, uh, you know, you can see that dialectics at play, the, the dialectical possibility simply because uh, everything that kind of is promoted by hmm, the Californians will not work and has not worked for a good 30 years here or more. Huh? So, um, yeah. Uh, so in that sense, um, yeah. Um, I'm not really sure, um, you know, how much uh, the regulation on the legal side will do I think uh, it's much, much better to look at, uh, let's say, um, AI um, uh, applied in very, very different um, uh, industrial contexts. That's where, um, you know, I would look if I think of uh, Europe. Thank you, Gert, for your very interesting analysis uh, of uh, the platform and also I like very much your book, Said by Design, that I think the title very well condense the spirit of time. So thank you for that. But my question is, by paraphrasing Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, I know you are also a social mm -hmm. activist, what is to be done? Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. What is to be done? Okay. Um, this, uh, I, I think I, I can only really answer, answer that question from a European perspective, right? What is to be done, let's say, for activists in Hong Kong is very different. Uh, and it's also very different, let's say, for those who want to further uh, politicize or grow, let's say, a movement like Black Lives Matter in the United States. Right? So I don't really think that at the moment uh, there, is, there is hardly any, uh, you know, global dialogue on this question. Let's, let's face it. Mm -hmm. um, there is a, um, there's an increased fragmentation and for the right or the wrong political reasons, a lot of us have to deal with very, very close, uh, maybe even local or even, or even, you know, on, on, the, on the home or street level uh, fights and uh, uh, interrogations and uh, possibilities. Uh, I think the global uh, imagination for, for, the, for the political dialogue uh, has never been so weak. Uh, and, and we can clearly see that also in the in the in the dialogues, you know, the complete um, the dialogues between Europe's uh, intellectuals and uh, those in America, but also in Asia, has completely dried up. There's no such thing. Hmm? Uh, 
uh, and even inside Europe, um, well, especially now under COVID, but uh, you know, even even using let's say Teams and Zoom and whatever, uh, there there is not much happening. So uh, there is an enormous, um, yeah, withdrawal. I would say, um, and this is really uh, terrifying. Uh, but you know, under and COVID, of course, has uh, accelerated this which uh, was a tendency that was already there, right? Uh, already a few years ago, this was, uh, this was n noticeable. And of course, Brexit and Trump uh, in 2016 is, is, a, is a kind of a, already a symbolic moment when, when this uh, was uh, put into place. Uh, so uh, the question what's to be done uh, is, is increasingly answered uh, you know, on a, on a hyper-local uh, level. And, uh, and there, you know, you might see very uh, interesting uh, questions in, t in terms of, uh, you know, people who organize themselves, uh, um, people who work uh, on, on some more sustainable, uh, you know, alternatives uh, uh, when it comes to energy, transportation, you name it, right? When you start to look at that level, there's certainly a lot happening. <laughs> but specifically with respect to the platform. My yeah, choice. but specifically to the platform, there's not much. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, then this is exactly the problem. So the there is the the the, pro, the platform is uh, is hegemonic, and uh, there is no uh, force that uh, can I, I can see. Uh, can really uh, either question or let alone overcome uh, the platform logic. I'm very sorry. Thank you. I think uh, Jan, Jan has a question. Uh, you're muted, Jan. Yeah, yeah. Fears, um, to, con to counter the point of Zoom fatigue, we can also do Zoom acceleration. Geert, I'm happy to hear an Amsterdam voice mm -hmm. in, our, in our gathering. Yes, of course. And um, your key point is the shift from the network to the platform. Mm -hmm. Question, is the issue in the platform the recentering, the reestablishment of of a center mm -hmm. and network theory going back to the 1950s in computer science already had the idea um, that what matters is centers, centers that organize mm -hmm. the flow of information, organization of, of information, etc. And um, when there is one center, the system is vulnerable. When there are multiple centers, then for outside attack, there's more resilience. When a center is organized in an omnicentric way that multiple points uh, hold the information and the information flow, um, that is a decentering that is empowering. So when you say we go from media to network to platform, platform actually means a recentered network that is therefore also more vulnerable. But when you talk about the optimism of young people and activists, etc., uh, I hear stories of people being enthusiastic about the digital, digital organization of, of labor markets that can enable them to get jobs and, and find job opportunities. And young people in Europe are enthusiastic about that. So can we do, um, can we say that when platforms are decentered networks 
at the same time, what is what is happening is a reorganization outside the platforms. That is like what Rita talk, talks about. The, the, there's the two levels of your discussion. The visuals are very, um, they illustrate the ground stagnation and your text um, also discussed, but um, aren't then platforms themselves inherently limited, although they may be mesmerizing, hypnotizing, but inherently limited in what they can, can achieve. So that is a way out too. Yeah, thanks. Um, first of all, um, I think the current um, platforms uh, have by and large, um, uh, you know, um, let's say, absorbed the uh, network logic and the networks themselves. Yeah, so that was the first stage. Then in the second stage, um, let's say, um, dissolved the social uh, relationship uh, and turned uh, these um, members and notes into, uh, let's say, neoliberal individualized users uh, that still looked at their social life, uh, maybe from a, a network perspective, but um, uh, as I describe it, you know, these are the networks without the tools. Uh, so, so people still find themselves in some sorts of networks, uh, but they don't, they don't really uh, have the tools anymore to effectively, um, you know, organize these networks, change it, and, uh, you know, define uh, its parameters. And of course, uh, yes, uh, privacy and, uh, you know, uh, some kind of, uh, yeah, sense of um, belonging or, um, you know, which uh, is often uh, associated with that Judeo-Christian word community, which I, I don't like, but okay. Uh, so there is a sense of, uh, of community uh, in, in these uh, networks. And that, of course, uh, has uh, you know been all but uh, uh, destroyed by uh, by the platform, um, because in the platform, you know, people are just sole actors. They uh, and, and of course, the platform, uh, you know, and and the, the, uh, let's say, um, you know, in the recent literature. This is uh, what been described very, very well. Um, all these platforms are essentially, uh, you know, economic uh, markets. Hmm? They organize uh, markets, hmm? and so the social or the noise or the beauty or the irregularity, uh, the singularity of the social, your kinship, the the the, the weird relationships you have with friends, your biography, uh, you, you as an individual, uh, you come with all that garbage uh, into the world, right? Um, and and the, the networks can very, very, very often uh, accommodate that, but the platforms are completely agnostic about all that uh, human bullshit. So, you know, so this is really, because it's not, it cannot really be um, turned, uh, you know, into um, into money, into value. Um, at best, uh, it, it can, uh, you know, be turned into advertisement, uh, eyeballs, uh, and um, um, clickbait uh, type of uh, economics. But th this is not really interesting because the new platforms, as we know them, are hyper efficient, uh, very, very much deeply monetized, financialized, uh, let's say, um, plateaus of transaction, right? Uh, and, and they are in, in a way very efficient, but also very cold. So what you describe, Jan, uh, I think uh, uh, is good, but 
you know, maybe we we have we find in that element we already find something of the of the solution of the way out. Hmm? Because we can expect that the platform logic will only be more ruthless, will only be more, there will be only be more uh, Black Fridays and so on and so on, right? Yeah? Uh, so th this kind of, uh, th that kind of in intensification is what we can expect, which means that the overall, uh, you know, alienation uh, can only be, uh, you know, further on the rise. So it looks like we have three more questions. Um, okay. Maybe you should collect the three and then um, and then you can answer them in turn. Um, so we have Barry, uh, Trinankur, and then uh, Bishnu. Uh, thank you, Brett. Uh, thank you for your time. It was a really, very interesting talk. I, I think in some respects you've answered what I was interested in, which is the flip side of Tommaso's uh, Leninist intervention, um, which is if there's no, ob if there's no obvious countervailing pressure coming from the grassroots or regulation, where does the unassailed logic of the platform lead? You've gone some way to answer that, I think. Mm. But I'd like further reflection if you could give it. Trinankur, do you wanna, do you wanna put yeah. your question there too and then we'll- Yeah, it's difficult. We'll um, yeah, it is true that I've, I've uh, already answered that question, but um, uh, let's also, you know, give it a possibility that um, given the multitude of um, centers that we have in, in the world right now, not one center, not one empire, uh, but it, it could also mean that you know, in different parts of the world, uh, we will see other approaches uh, here to this uh, to this platform question, which is of course a question of how we how we deal with uh, uh, this inevitable form of centralization, rationalization, and also very very cost effective forms um, uh, of uh, of operation. Yeah? Um, of course, I myself I'm very interested to see you know new platforms that would completely and only for deal, for instance, with the question of organization, of organizing people. <laughs> that would be fun, right? I mean, uh, people have, of course, uh, started to, you know, speculate a little bit about, uh, you know, could the, could the platform be the real follow-up of the political party? Hmm? Uh, the membership in political parties are really, really stagnant the world over. And uh, even though they're in power almost everywhere, including in China, uh, you know, with its uh, with its two million uh, members of the Chinese Communist Party, um, yeah, I mean, what what is the the power essentially of that party in comparison to the the the, the, the enormous potential that uh, the platforms have, right? And uh, it's, uh, for instance, especially the, the, the Chinese uh, rulers uh, are acutely aware uh, of that. And they haven't really uh, dealt with that. Mm? And so um, I would, uh, I would uh, you know, uh, be hopeful in that sense that um, we should really uh, experiment uh, much, much more. And at the moment, of course, within the European imaginary, there's only one option, and that is regulation, right? And that is that we deal this whole question that we are discussing here to lawyers huh? and say, this is a legal uh, question. Uh, the lawyers will sort it out for us, right? W and, but what is essentially a social, a cultural, and a political question uh, uh, in the European uh, imaginary uh, can only be resolved by lawyers. Hmm? Uh, and yeah, this is of course for me completely unacceptable, but it also says something, uh, you know, about the weakness, uh, let's say also of the left or what's, uh, what's left of the left, uh, that uh, it can only come up with uh, legal uh, solutions to this question. 
should I go ahead? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, my question was regarding your comment about Facebook uh, and Instagram and all these being very advanced advertising platforms. And if we zoom out a little, and if we look at 19th century capitalism, we also see that vision was also being ranged from the body and being quantified and then being used for uh, you know social economic organizations and uh, of course the birth of the consumer in that way in 19th century uh, capitalism mm -hmm. and here instead of vision we see embodied participation being ranged free uh, from the body and then being quantified and then being used for these new late capitalist socioeconomic processes and uh, I, I'm wondering, apart from the fact that, you know, vision has been replaced by embodied participation in this process, is there something fundamentally new in terms of, you know, quantification and then repurposing themselves for uh, capitalist processes? Uh, although there are two different yeah. kinds of capitalist processes, but no, they're fundamentally yeah. different. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. It's a very, very good question because, uh, you know, uh, it, it really goes to the question also of, um, uh, my generation, maybe, uh, that is really now challenged really by, um, let's say, Shushan Zuboff's uh, book, Surveillance Capitalism. Uh, and, the, and the question, if, uh, if we have uh, some, let's say, more refined or even superior uh, analytic framework that could uh, describe the same process or, you know, what you describe here as a, you know, extraction. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, she has done that uh, quite, uh, quite well. Uh, but, um, you know, is, is there anyone uh, in, a, you know, in our circles that, uh, that uh, you know, can do that, uh, for instance, also from a Marxian or post-Marxian uh, perspective? Because obviously, uh, uh, Shoshana Zuboff uh, doesn't have that, uh, that kind of uh, framework. Hmm? And, um, and uh, you know, there also it is the question, uh, in, maybe that has been around for, for a while uh, now, already in 80s and 90s, uh, is, the, is the question of uh, the crisis of value and value creation, accumulation, uh, and in, in, that, in that perspective. Hmm? That uh, I would find very, uh, you know, interesting. I think um, sometimes we tend to believe that, the, let's say, the, the value debate hmm, uh, has uh, kind of uh, come to a, a dead end street, and uh, and that uh, you know the conclusions uh, of that uh, debate, um, yeah, are inconclusive, or we don't quite know. Sometimes they're very abstract. We don't know uh, because it, they should, in fact, in my uh, proposition, they should uh, be applied to this. <laughs> they, the, the latest findings of the of the value, uh, you know, debate should be uh, applied to to the question of, uh, you know, what exactly is happening in this in this process. Uh, of extraction that we see happening on these platforms that uh, uh, Zuboff describes uh, so well. Thank you so much. To, uh, thank you the, yeah, thank you, Brett. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, and uh, I'm also of your generation and watching uh, the politics unfold with my uh, students and young activists. So I wanted to follow um, a little bit on that. I wonder if in terms of what is to be done if we distend, make a distance between social media and the platform? Because I'm uh, thinking about young activists who, for whom far from being completely absorbed and manipulated by the platform, they in fact are quite cynical and flexible about it in the sense that, you know, they'll say, I'm thinking of Kashmir, where you actually need something like Facebook to amplify the video you have, you know, sort of uh, uh, stolen and taken out of the state, right? So they are on phones, they're on word-to-word uh, -word communication, they're on all kinds of media that interface with the platform. So when we, that, 
Um, WhatsApp, of course, is massive, right, in, in places in the global mm -hmm. south. So, you know, the, those kinds of uh, hybrid media assemblages, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I see it as a, almost a de-intensification of the platform, which activists often use rather instrumentally and rather cynically. So um, I'm, I'm just curious about that. And it's, of course, again, speaking generationally, I'm watching this. There are new forms of uprising, right? Which is not the traditional left, but it doesn't mean they're not happening, right? Black Lives Matter is a mm -hmm. magnificent example of that. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about whether as the platform becomes more centralized, more rationalized, it also shrinks in significance for politics. Yeah. And that is, uh, you know, what I uh, indicated at uh, earlier as uh, the infrastructural turn which um, goes then uh, in the direction of Catherine Hales, uh, uh, where she speaks of, uh, you know, the, the technological subconscious, um, uh, which uh, I find, uh, you know, very different, uh, diff uh, interesting in, in, this, uh, in this respect. Um, it also means kind of that, um, you know, for, for next generations, um, these um, uh, infrastructures that and architectures that we have uh, been fighting and that we uh, initially, uh, let's say two, two, 10 years ago, um, uh, started to dislike uh, for next generations will just be the given. Um, in the same way as we maybe ac accepted you know that uh, the generation of electricity was uh, was done by this and this uh, platform and maybe you know at the time edison <laughs> maybe he had a very different ideas and uh, yeah about this uh, uh, and we are not uh, necessarily uh, you know fighting this even though you know i'm uh, come from the 70s and uh, we were fighting uh, nuclear energy so uh, and uh, that was clearly uh, of course uh, part of uh, of the uh, the generation of electricity so politicizing uh, you know the, the generation of electricity at the moment is of course again a worldwide uh, struggle uh, with many many activists uh, fighting uh, against the use of coal uh, and so on and so on and of course uh, in alternative terms um, fighting uh, in favor of um, let's say uh, wind energy solar panels and so on and so on so uh, uh, yeah I think the so the the fight over the ownership and the architecture of such architectures uh, of such uh, yeah um, um, yeah, they 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 will be with us, but um, you know maybe the next generations will will uh, will pick other fights hmm, uh, there, and as you say, um, uh, they will maybe um, be much more uh, pragmatic, uh, for instance, towards uh, something like uh, Facebook. Uh, and uh, use it in different ways, even though we will say, you know, uh, uh, you, you will always uh, lose that and uh, you will always, uh, in the end, uh, be, be cent censored and <laughs> surveilled and, uh, and especially limited, right? Limited in your possibility, not only to communicate, but especially to organize yourself because you have given um, uh, the possibility out of your hands. Uh, to uh, develop your own tools because Facebook can, uh, you know, allow anything on the content level, but it will never allow anything uh, like uh, the development of uh, tools uh, inside that uh, platform. So we're coming up on two o'clock. So I guess um, with that, a big thank you, um, Gert, for joining us. Um, fascinating stuff. Thank you, everybody, for the questions. And um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. All right. Bye bye, Gert.